Old Turkic peoples consider Altai a sacral place and their ancestral home. Legend has it that the mystical father of the Turkic Athnos was suckled by a she-wolf, like Romulus and Remus, the founders of Rome. This is one of the few occasions when modern historical science indirectly confirms ancient fairy tales and myths. According to the version put forward by Lev Nikolaevich Gumilov, Prince Ashina was guarding the borders with the Chinese Empire, but in the late 3rd century AD he came into conflict with the Emperor and had to flee with his warriors here, to the slopes of the Altai Mountains. There were few of them, only about 500 or 1,000. Yet having mixed with local Altai population, three generations later, the descendants of Prince Ashina founded the great empire of the Turkic Khaganate, the territory of which extended from the Pacific to the Black Sea. The best time for an eco-hike in Altai is no doubt summer, when bumblebees buzz over blossoming flowers and there are tons of mushrooms and berries in the woods. What if you decide to spend your New Year's here? Not a problem, as in winter there are as many fascinating things that you can do and learn here. German scientist Piotr Simon Pallas was the first researcher of Altai. He launched his first expedition from Semipalatinsk in 1770. In his diary he wrote that his horses were loaded with the most modern equipment of that time. A sextant, quadrant, marine timepiece, aerometer, hydrometer, precipitation gauge, field glass and of course a triangular hat, high boots, barometer and thermometer. Fortunately today almost all these things can fit into a smartphone, but we still have quite a lot of gear. This house will be our shelter tonight. The Beryozovka tourist camp is located at the western foot of the Ivana Bridge, in the vicinity of the Three Brothers Summit. It's at the highest peak of Western Altai, only 2,380 meters above sea level, but the most popular among free riders. East Kazakhstan region has tourist camps of different comfort levels, for any taste and wallet. This time we'll focus not on elite, but on ecological tourism. The World Tourism Organization has identified two main criteria for ecotourism. It has to facilitate the financial development of local communities and at the same time serve the purpose of wildlife conservation. In our opinion, the Berezovka tourist camp fully meets both of them. A group of enthusiasts had turned a desolate village into a popular ecotourism destination. Let's see what's so peculiar about it. We are now on the premises of the eco-settlement of Berezovka. Here in Western Altai, it means a household far from other villages. And now this is what they also call tourist camps or sites. Today the owner of this place, Tatiana Smola, will show us the secrets of the ancient ceramics production and we will cook a rabbit in the Russian oven. Tatiana, what is this? It is a flute, an authentic ocarina flute. Its another design is called Sasunai. Now we have to temper it in cold water. In Kazakh, the word sir stands for mystery and the word nai denotes various tubular musical instruments. Saz means clay, thus saz ser nai means a clay flute telling about something intimate and enigmatic. Many world religions say that the Creator made the first human from clay.
For thousands of years, the secrets of making ceramics have not changed. We went to several deposits, found these clay samples and got so inspired that we immediately went to the local history museum to see the indigenous pottery items that our ancestors had produced in the past. Do you remember Olja Suleimanov's poem, The Clay Book? Perhaps a clay flute in the hands of a soccer master could indeed uncover a lot of sacral secrets. According to the legend, with the help of Sassenai, an experienced shaman Baxi could communicate with the Aruaks, the spirits of the ancestors. Large ski resorts have excellent restaurants, but in such small but very cozy guest houses, you can try traditional cuisine enjoyed by local residents several hundreds of years ago. My grandfather, an old believer, shared this recipe of cooking rabbit in sour cream with me. Need a hand, Julia? Why not? Only be careful. I need gloves. Is this the rabbit that you were talking about? Yes, cooked in the old Russian oven. Rabbit in sour cream. Lucky we. A dream come true. Tanya, last summer there was a lot of online and media coverage about a bear that came to your camp and scared tourists. Yes, it was true. A bear started coming to our settlement regularly and was not afraid of people, loud generator or chainsaw sounds. We were a little concerned, but it left after a while. In summer, in the camp's vicinity, you can indeed encounter a real bear. But during the New Year's holidays, tourists are attracted by bears like this. This family recreation center is located at the foot of the Ivana Bridge on the bank of the Gromotoka River. Parents with children come here from Oskemen, Almaty and even Nur Sultan to visit the residents of Grandfather Frost. Is this throne really made of ice? Of course. I thought it was plastic. Here, little guy, you can touch it. What are you reading? Correspondence? Yes, these are the letters from kids with their New Year's wishes. So I'm reading them to see what gifts they want. This letter is from a boy. Here's what it says. Hello, my dear Grandfather Frost. I behaved well all year long, although I'm not that good at school. I promise to do better next year. I'm seven. I do sports, biathlon and skiing. And here's what he wants as a gift. Please make me smarter and give me a rifle. Of course, my dear, you will get smarter on your own and I will put aside a rifle for you, no doubt. The fairy tale village has not only Grandfather Frost and Snow Maiden, but also rascals, Fimi Hobgoblins or Kikimuras, forest spirits or Leshis and even a real Baba Yaga. It seems like nobody's trying my culinary masterpiece. Here I also have a Serpentarium, as well as a Beetle and Spider collection. It's scary in the cave of the forest spirits, yet so interesting. Hop! Wow! Girls, what is it? It's a hare, a real wild hare. <laughs> no, 
children from surrounding communities don't have to go to Lapland to ride a sled with Santa Claus, as here they have their own grandfather Frost. The owner of the Gromotuka Tourist Camp, Sergei Tretikov and his colleagues specialize in winter and summer family recreation. They not only organize celebrations, but also equestrian and hiking excursions and trips for children and their parents. It's fun visiting Grandfather Frost, but we have to get ready for ascending the three brothers. So this is the famous Three Brothers route. Yes, it's the most popular trail. We are here. In just one day, we can cross the zones of black taiga, mixed forest, cedar forest, wooden tundra, tundra and permafrost. As far as I understand, this is the old Porcini man. And this here is the wooden grandfather Altai. By the way, Alexander von Humboldt was the first to propose an interpretation of the geographical name Altai as a modified Turkic word Altin, or gold. This is our grandfather Altai, bearded, harsh and covered with white frost. Baron Wilhelm Heinrich Alexander von Humboldt started his famous journey to Altai in the spring of 1829. By this time he was already a world-famous scientist, and the Russian Minister of Finance of the time, Count Kurkin, gave him an armed security convoy and a 20,000 rubles fee. It was huge money. For example, back then a cow costed less than one ruble. The famous scientist put forward a hypothesis about the volcanic origin of the Altai mountain system. But 20 years later, as a result of several expeditions led by Semyonov Tenchansky, it was proved wrong. We are all packed, our snowmobiles are warmed up and we are ready for the adventure. Guide Ivan Karpov will take us to the Lesnova Alpine camp and hand over to Yevgeny Kozmin. So these are the famous three brothers. Yes, and this is how our route will go. Free riders love it. We want to get there on snowmobiles. Isn't the snow too deep for snowmobiles? Here it's about 1.5 meters deep and will be even more on the top. We will be taken to the summit by a famous sportsman. Yevgeny Kozmin, a well-known free-ride instructor of the Rider Extreme Group, will show us the best of the ecotourism in Western Altai. He promised to take us to the Three Brothers. We want to show you an eco-route which we hope will see active development in the nearest future. In summer we have a lot of guests from abroad as well as our local children. The main purpose of our route is to advance children tourism, promote children's sports and bring them up environmentally sensitive. We want to build a children base camp here. Our snowmobiles feel okay on the trampled trail but buried deep into the virgin snow. The Lasnova tourist camp is located halfway on the Three Brothers Eco Trail. We spent a lot of time wondering what the name means, thinking maybe it was a last name. But then it came to us, it means Las Snova, or forest again, or new forest in English. Alexei Rybalka, the camp's owner, is here and we want to talk to him about the development of local ecotourism. We started building the camp seven years ago. So that athletes, first of all climbers, as well as free rider Virgin Snow fans could stop over here. Gradually the demand built up. In addition to athletes, ordinary tourists started coming as well. We are slowly expanding.
The Sport Tourism Federation of East Kazakhstan region was active in the project since its very inception. NP1, NP1 or initial level climbing training takes place here in May and November. According to Aslan Muratovic, by no means should tourism become fully commercial. We need to consider the role of mass and especially children tourism in patriotic and ecological upbringing of the next generation. We are almost there. Athletes are at the starting line and our filming crew, drowning in snow, is looking for a convenient shooting site. Well, the guys are almost on the top and will soon start riding down. Our task is to film their descent. Free ride is developing very quickly and is one of the promising types of tourism both in the Tianshan and here in Altai. Such small guest houses for free riders are popping up like mushrooms. Let's get ready, they are preparing to go down. Climbing up is certainly not easy, but it's good fitness. And what a pleasure is to ride down at wind speed. Let's go. Wow, it's gorgeous and it's pure adrenaline. Small tour operators of East Kazakhstan region for sure cannot compete with the world's ski resorts, but they found their own price niche. In addition, environmental friendliness is yet another important competitive advantage of such small business. The eco-revolution is taking place before our rise along with the fourth post-industrial revolution. People want that the money they spend traveling served the good of the planet's wildlife. Last year, global ecotourism industry earned $2 billion a day. So far, the share of the Three Brothers route in this figure is small, but it's quite decisive in the economy of Birozovka village. We are continuing our journey and decide to hit the Museum of Local History of the town of Rida along the way. Here at the museum, we often host thematic tourist groups. It's the so-called cultural and research tourism. For example, we had groups interested in crystallography, history of engineering, astrobleems, history and ethnography of old believers. Getting ready for the expedition, we went to several meteorite hunter sites and found out that it's quite a large community. Every year, thousands of stalkers from different countries of the world go to the most exotic countries in search of stones fallen from the sky. Not everyone, but some even manage to make good money off of their hobby. Some of these stones are very expensive. One of the most popular expositions in our museum is dedicated to Ridder Astrobleems. Since 2014, geologist Viktor Fyodorovich Kuznetsov has been working on a hypothesis about the origin of the Ridder raw deposit that has already been supported by a broad scientific community. He practically proved that about three to four hundred million years ago, a huge amount of space substance fell here in the area of the Rida Plateau. There exist both legal and black market of fallen celestial items. Perhaps the most famous astrobleme in the world is the black stone embedded in one of the walls of the Kaaba in Mecca. In 930, the Kamatians captured Mecca, robbed the Kaaba and took the black stone to Bahrain. In 951, after paying a large ransom, the stone came back to Mecca. Well, 
Viktor Fyodorovich Kuznetsov found this sample in the vicinity of our town. Its spectral analysis showed that it's different from other types of stones found on Earth. Not every stalker manages to find a valuable meteorite or a gold nugget in the Altai Mountains. But everyone has a chance of coming across an old moss-covered gold miner dugout hidden deep in the woods, or say finding an old pickaxe, tray or burden rifle. You can even find an ancient mine. The treasures of the Oral Tai have attracted people since the early Bronze Age. Our museum exhibits artifacts confirming that already 4,000 years ago, this area was the center of mining and non-ferrous metallurgy. The route of our expedition goes further, deep into western Altai. We intend to get to the upper streams of the Black Uba, cramped in between the Tigirak, Koksu and Uba ranges. Yet at first we want to get acquainted with another type of tourism new for eastern Kazakhstan. When a child, I used to read romantic books about traveling across Alaska on dog sleds, and I dreamed of doing something like this myself. I thought that to do so, I would have to go to the far north, but it turns out that you can do it in eastern Kazakhstan no problem. Christina Sumina is keen on dog sled racing, and she has a wonderful sled. In Kazakhstan, sled dog racing has been developing for several years already. We even have a special federation. Unlike horse-drawn sledge, dunk sled doesn't have a brittle bit and the rider drives it only by giving voice commands. Forward, to the right, to the left, stop. Smart dogs know what their Masha wants. Can dog sledding become a type of ecotourism? No doubt. Because dogs always arouse interest among tourists. A lot of tourists who come here express their interest in dog riding. Yet it's hard calling a dog sled a type of transportation. It looks more like a free dog pack that can coherently move towards one target provided the human managing it can establish clear relations within this social group. So this sport is not only about physique but also psychology. We can also organize short weekend tours. That is, we go to the forest on a dog sled, have a nice walk in the forest and communicate with dogs, get some positive emotions and impressions and come back. Group tours are also no problem. We did it before. We are saying goodbye to Dmitri and Christina and are heading to the father's tourist camp on the slopes of the Stanaboy range. There's less snow in intermountain valleys than in the mountains, which makes it possible to keep cattle. Here and there across the meadows, we see haystacks, a true paradise for foxes, as they are full of tasty mice. As we are ascending, the snow gets deeper and then we suddenly find ourselves in the real black taiga. Although it is its southern part, this is the true Siberia with endless thick forests stretching for thousands of kilometers through the mountain Altai to Caucasia and Tiva. We crossed two rivers, conquered several huge snowdrifts and finally arrived at the Black Uba eco-settlement. This is how they used to build hunting huts before and now it's a guest lodge styled like a hunting cabin. 
After lunch, it's great to go to a real Siberian barnyard or steam house in English and go searching for bears afterwards. Do you know that, unlike rodents, bears don't go into full hibernation? They are just sleeping tight and sometimes even snore in their sleep. Do you hear snoring? This is a typical bear den and there's probably a big bear inside. Look, it even made a nice entrance which I will use to get inside. Wow, there are two of them. Here they are, a big one and a smaller one. Put it in the bag, fast. Quickly into the bag and to the zoo right away. No, to the circus, both of them. This eco-settlement is designed mainly for family recreation. Jokes, laughter, skiing, sledging, snowmobile riding and short educational hikes around the camp. These who enjoy a more severe touristic romance can also go on extensive adventure expeditions of different complexity. People living in Taiga are still engaged in the traditional sable hunting. As in the distant past, hunters live in outpost cabins all winter long, travel around using skin skis and use handmade household appliances. Perhaps only the snowmobile and the chainsaw tell us that we are in the 21st century and not in a hunter hut in a book by Fenimore Cooper. In the course of our journey to East Kazakhstan region, we have already seen a wide range of various types of tourism. And now we will see yet another one. Yevgeny Sidalnikov, director of the Black Uba hunting farm, will tell us about how an ancient hunting trade is turning into a modern type of tourism. An American came here once as a member of a tourist group and we talked extensively about hunting and hunting tourism. He told me about a model which we can easily apply in Kazakhstan – tourist marten hunting. So they have built modern but old-looking hunting cabins like they did 100 to 200 years ago, and they take groups of tourists, three, four people, around them. I want to organize five to ten days educational and hunting tours in my hunting farm also to demonstrate how our grandfathers did sable hunting and how they lived for months and months in hunting cabins in the past. Things are changing. We need to transform and adjust to the modern tourism market. Yevgeny takes us on a putik, which is a hunting trail with animal traps installed every 100-200 meters. It's hard keeping up with Evgeny riding skis, so he is often forced to stop to let us catch up. A professional hunter is not even a profession. It is a way of life. It's an ancient hunting culture that is passed on from father to son. In order to survive in these conditions, hunter must know and be able to do a lot of things. Survive not only physically, but also economically. That is, get some profit to pay his living. At present, a good hunter can get over a hundred sable skins during the hunting season. Yet the old-timers say that 70 years ago, getting only several of them was considered great luck. An old winter hunting cabin, or maybe a gold miner hut. The snow here can get up to two or three meters high and even cover the cabins up to the roof. So cattle farming opportunities are limited here. In the old days, local people did hunting, kept bees and washed gold.
we see the remains of beehives. It looks like it was an apiary. Earlier, every pastoralist used to be a bit of a hunter and a bit of a gold digger. In the Middle Ages, animal fur not only protected people from cold, but was considered a symbol of elite consumption. Nobility wore fur to distinguish themselves from commoners. Fur was very expensive. For example, for just one sable skin, the hunter collected more money than a peasant for a whole year of work. That forced many people to go into the forest and hunt, often overexploiting and robbing the woods of their wealth. In Europe, they have Martin, a close relative of Sable. Its fur also has commercial value, but not as high as that of Sable. Croatia, for example, reintroduced its ancient currency called Kuna after gaining independence. In the past, the Croatians also used Martin skins as money. In the Middle Ages, Martin was almost completely destroyed in Europe, but now its population is restoring. If a hunter kills over 30% of the autumn sable population on his hunting plot, it's considered to be overexploitation. If such a situation persists for several years, it may lead to complete sable extinction. This is exactly what happened in many places in the course of the 17th, 18th centuries, when sable disappeared almost completely. The then authorities tried to regulate this issue. There was even death penalty for violating the hunting ban called reserved at the time. Now we have reserves. In fact, in Russian this word comes from the word zakaz or reserved, that is, hunting prohibition. Of course, they were far from environmental protection and did it only for practical reasons. Yet, the temptation of super profits was so great that both hunters and officials found ways to circumvent the ban. Corruption. Peter the Great even ordered to hang the voivod or governor in English of Siberia, Prince Matvey Gagarin, for associated power abuses. Gold and furs. Furs and gold. They forced people to cross deep oceans, deadly deserts and thick woods, sparing neither their own nor others' lives, leaving nameless graves behind, creating gangs and trading companies. These are the two goods that gave rise to original capitalism, as two centuries later, oil gave birth to industrial society and digital technologies of the present are pushing forward Industry 4.0. For centuries, sable had served as an international convertible currency, and that could not but affect the overall condition of its population. The top sable production was registered in the 17th century. One year, 250,000 skins were sold. In the early 20th century, it dropped down to 8 to 10, maximum of 15,000 skins per year. In Soviet times, once an all-union moratorium was introduced, and local sable hunting moratoriums were introduced in different regions from time to time. In the 50s, they even carried out sable dissemination. They caught animals in Baguzin in Yakutia and resettled them across Taiga. Already in 1998, should my memory serve me right, we saw the modern record of 220,000 sold sable skins. But why would you need to get so much fur? Today there exists a simplified perception of the Great Silk Road that merchants would buy silk in Beijing and then take it to, say, Venice for 11,000 kilometers to sell. In fact, the Great Silk Road consisted of dozens and hundreds of branches, corridors and segments. Merchants resold goods to each other on different segments. 
The silk trade has been studied quite well, yet very few people know about another commodity that was moving along the Great Silk Road. And this is exactly fur skins. Central Asian merchants bought fur here in southern Altai, where we are now, and then took it to the fairs in Tobolsk, and even went further to the north. Here comes our first catch. Is it a male? Yes, it is. Is male larger than female? Yes. In one day, Yevgeny usually covers about 20 kilometers along the Putik Trail. Perhaps it's time for our film crew to stop hopelessly attempting to catch up with him. Better let's take a walk and on the way, share with you some information that we managed to find in open sources. Fur prices soared particularly high in the second half of the 16th century. It was the time of the rapid development of navigation. From the New World to Europe, there went flows of silver and gold. Average annual temperatures back then dropped by 4 degrees. Climatologists called that period the Little Ice Age. It was just cold in medieval castles and the nobility wrapped themselves up in fur. That was the reason for fur being very expensive. Rear Admiral Patrick Gordon, appointed by Peter the Great as regiment commander, wrote in his notes that his first year's salary was four sable skins, and that he had to give one of them away as a bribe to government clerks. Yet the remaining sables were enough to sustain himself all through the whole year. Many know, both from history and movies, that in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries, English and Dutch merchants exported Siberian furs through the port of Arhangelsk in the White Sea. Yet very few know that all that time China remained the main consumer of Siberian fur skins. The main transportation route was by dryland. In fact, the main purpose of the famous journey by Ivan Krusenstern and Lysiansky was to find safer and cheaper transportation routes to China. Light, compact, imperishable and expensive fur was an extremely profitable commodity for merchants. It was exported from Siberia via two main routes, to the east and to the west. All of us know the phrase Sorok Sorokov, 40 times 40 in English, but not everybody knows how it originated. The fact is that in the Middle Ages, when Central Asian merchants were buying Siberian fur, that was their counting measure, Kirik or 40. Then the numeral Sorok turned into the noun Sorok. It's basically a bale in which 40 sable skins were packed together. Even the old taxing forms of business documents contained such phrases as a sable Sorok was paid by squirrel skins. It means that a sable sorok was a financial tool that could be paid not only by sable skins, but also by gold or other goods. The topic of sable hunting and trade is so interesting and so exotic for Kazakhstan that we could devote a whole outdoor world episode just to it. Probably in the future we will do exactly that. Yet now it's time for us to return from the snowy mountains of the Altai as other no less exciting and fascinating trips are awaiting us.